Hey, can everybody see that? Yes. Great. All right. So um, I'm not gonna. I guess I'm not gonna watch the chat. But if you have anything to bring up, just uh, interrupt me. But yeah, today I'm going to talk about um, from bonbons to brownies. You have flies to thank for your chocolate. So. This is, uh, you know, when people say, ew, flies, or they are grossed out by flies or things like that, I often ask them, do you like chocolate? And 95% of the time, I do know several people who don't like chocolate at all, but 95% of the time, people love chocolate, and so it's a way to show them that they do owe flies something. Um, and uh, first, I should mention, obviously, we know that... Um, that chocolate doesn't grow right from trees, uh, that it is produced and, and, uh, and processed. So we're not lucky enough to just be able to pick it right off trees, but it does come from a tree. Um, and so let's meet Theobroma cacao, the chocolate plant, this chocolate tree. Um, so Theobroma is a genus of plants in the family Malvaceae. And actually we eat many members and use many members of this family, including cotton, okra, and hibiscus, among others. Um, and the name Theobroma actually translates to food of the gods because of this great delicacy that comes from it that has been around for hundreds or thousands of years uh, in the native areas where it's grown. So there are about 20 species uh, throughout Central and South America where they're native to. Um, and these are small trees, they're not huge trees. They get about 10 to 20, maybe 30 feet tall and are typically in the understory. Uh, they're not breaking through the canopy. Uh, they're kind of in the jungle, in the understory of the, of the areas. And you can see here a variety of different pods that are produced. And this one on the right is the one that we'll be talking about mainly today. So, so if you look at where they are from, this is actually iNatural re records of Theobroma. Now some like up here in Ohio and places like that are probably in botanical gardens and whatnot, but you can see uh, the highest diversity is around uh, Central and South America, but it has been brought to other areas of the world in the tropics, uh, of course, to grow uh, for chocolate produ production. So, here is Theobroma cacao, that species that we use for chocolate. Uh, again, not a very large plant, uh, but you can see those pods where the, the chocolate, the cocoa beans come from. Now, uh, actually, even though it originates in Central and South America, it's actually um, West Africa that produces the bulk of uh, cocoa beans. So Ivory Coast, Ghana, uh, Nigeria, and Cameroon, but also Indonesia and Brazil produce a lot. So Matt, um, yes. I have a question on the chat from Jen. Can the tree be grown in North Carolina? So it's, it, it, I've seen it actually, they have some specimens up in the Durham uh, Museum of Life and Sciences in their butterfly house. And that's actually the only one I've seen in real life. Uh, so it is there, but it is a tropical tree, of course. So growing outside, I don't think it survives very well here. Um, I'd have to look up the hardiness zone that grows in and it's possible, I guess, but, uh, and of course with, things are warming up too, so who knows, but um, you'd have to really check your hardiness zone and see um, and I guess it is possible, uh, but, but again, it's, it's more of a tropical species, so it may require the really warm temperatures and certain types of climate. Mm -hmm. Great, great question. That's making me think I need to grow one in my yard. Um, well, I have to say, Dan, <laughs> if you if you grow your own trees, please don't forget to send us a piece of chocolate for <laughs> yes. Pat and, and me, please. <laughs> yes. Um, so yes, they grow basically in the tropics. And again, outside of the native range, they're used a lot for agriculture, obviously for making the chocolate that we love. Uh, so I'm not gonna talk to you today though about the process of making chocolate. There's lots of resources, there's some great videos online on how you go from this, these beans and this, uh, this fleshy fruit uh, to this beautiful chocolate that we love. Uh, but I will talk about how you actually get the beans and how it's pollinated. Um, so, uh, Chocolate is really interesting. The Theobroma tree is really interesting in that the flowers grow directly from the trunks and larger branches. So they're not like typical trees or plants where the flowers grow from the tips of, of branches or near leaves. They grow right out of the trunk. There'll be a little uh, area that starts to puff out and you'll get these little clusters of flowers. The other interesting thing is for the size of the pods and the size of the trees, the flowers are very small on average one to two centimeters long or in width. So about the size of your thumbnail, 
uh, in width. So they're very tiny flowers, actually. Now, to see the flower up close, they're really pretty looking flowers. Um, and they're very interesting structure. And part of the structure is part of this, the, the structure is actually a big part of the story about the pollination. So what you have here is you have a, a flower that's both has male and female parts. And so in the center, you've got this uh, female part uh, that's called, I think the style, and then these male parts, which I'll talk about later on, which include these parts that don't have any pollen on them. And then these parts with the pollen that are under this little hood. Uh, and again, very small flowers, so really only very small things can get in there. And that's basically uh, the crux of, of this pollination story is that is it needs a specific type of pollinator. So as far as the biology of the pollination, so most species can't self-pollinate. So you can't take one pollen from one flower and put it on another flower in the same tree and get it typically. Now they have bred varieties that do self-pollinate, but it's actually apparently not as tasty as some of the other ones. So cross-pollination is really important. The flowers are also only active for about 24 hours. Uh, apparently pollination in the morning is the most important, but they're very, very uh, uh, ephemeral flower. Uh, some variety uh, flowers are constant, while some varieties flower constantly, while others are only seasonal. Uh, so some are going to be uh, found all the year round flowering, and others are going to be, if you miss it, you'll miss all the flowers. And fruit set, the uh, transition from flowers to fruit, is actually fairly low. Uh, I saw estimates from anywhere from 1% to 50%, which is a huge range. But you're talking about only 10 to 15% of the flowers become fruit, actually. So it's actually a pretty finicky uh, plant when it comes to it. Now, here's what the pods look like. Now, they have these little tiny flowers, like I said, but they grow these very large uh, pods. The pods are about the size of a mini football um, and uh, American football. And uh, they have this white fleshy, uh, these fruits or these uh, these. Uh, these white fleshy outer coatings and inside that is the cocoa bean. Now the white fleshy substance is actually eaten by people and used in drinks and things like that. I've actually had it before and it's actually, it's pretty tasty, but it's not exported much. The beans, however, again, are used to produce chocolate. And again, I won't go into that, uh, but uh, I'm sure there's some great stuff out there for you to figure out how to go from beans to chocolate. And it actually involves a fermentation process and some other really special steps. Okay, so that's the tree. So let's meet punkies, noceums, and biting midges. So this is one of my favorite groups of flies. Um, and I am a very large guy, and I love these, even though they're very, very tiny. So this family Ceratopogonidae uh, is a family of true flies in the order Diptera, and that's the theme of this bug fest is flies. And there are over 5,000 species in the world. That means just in this group of, of flies, there are almost as many species as there are, are all mammals on earth known. So very diverse family, one of the larger families of flies actually, they're distantly related to mosquitoes. They're not super closely related, but they're in the same general group as mosquitoes. Um, and thus some feed on blood. Uh, others are predators. And I'll show you some other life histories in a moment. The larvae often live in aquatic habitats or semi-aquatic habitats. This is actually a larva of one that I collected from a gutter I was cleaning out. Um, it was full of wet leaves and things like that. They can be found fully aquatic in ponds and places like that and streams and also in tree holes. Uh, but also the group we're going to talk about today has some other habitats. Um, they are very small, uh, as I mentioned. They're from one to five millimeters long. So it's, I say about an eighth of an inch. Honestly, they're about half, they're about a 16th of an inch long usually, uh, or less than an eighth of an inch. A five millimeter long specimen or a quarter long specimen, quarter inch long specimen is huge, is massive for this group. So very small, you can see these are attracted to the light and these are actually the threads in a bed sheet. And so they're very tiny. Um, and actually here are males, they have the fuzzy antennae and here's a female that has the bare antennae. Now, there's a lot of really interesting groups. So there's some predatory ones. They're kind of sleek and they've got uh, raptorial, very heavy front legs or spiny legs that they use to capture prey and they jab them and suck out their contents. They often hunt like weak 
uh, flies, rel close relatives like uh, Chironomid midges uh, and some others. Um, and there's even one species where the, the female will suck the brains out of the male while they're mating. So these are, these are strong predators. They have crazy claws on them. They're a really interesting group of, of Ceratopogonid midges. Um, but that's the predatory ones. One that people actually might be intimately familiar with are the sand flies or the punkies that bite near the beach or near marshy areas. So if you're ever getting bit by something that's very painful and it's very tiny, you can almost not see it. Again, these are on me and this is the size of my hair. So you can see they're very tiny, tiny flies and they have a very painful bite and can actually transmit diseases to livestock um, and humans in some areas of the world. So these are also a type of punky or midge uh, in the group that the pollinators of chocolate are. But the one I really want to talk about today, the group I want to talk about today in, these, in this family are the, in the genus Forsifamaya. So this is a really interesting genus. Uh, I'll give you some specifics in a moment, but this is one of my favorite photos I've taken. And this, is, um, this was taken in Raleigh, actually at Lake Johnson. And you see the fly there and it's sucking on something and it looks interesting. And I would love to hear some guesses if anybody wants to guess on what that is that it's feeding on. So what do you think people, so write down on the chat box, what do you think that is that part where the fly is on? So people are saying a uh, cockroach leg, spider leg, insect leg. So I think that everybody thinks that it's a leg. It, kind of a well, leg. that's good, it is a leg. But it's, these flies are so tiny that this is actually the leg of a daddy long legs. Wow. And you know how thin those are that this fly is resting right on top. And so that's a really interesting part of their biology is that this group often feeds on other insects like mosquitoes do to us. They'll pierce the cuticle and suck the hemolymph, which is the blood of, of, uh, of the insect or other arthropod. And actually certain groups may feed on specifically on certain things like dragonflies or lacewings or whatnot. So this genus for Sipomaya is actually a huge genus. It's about a fifth of the size of the entire family, about over 1,100 species in the world just in this genus. The adults are small, about one to three millimeters and hairy. Uh, this is one that I took at my house in North Carolina here. Um, and they're very hairy flies, uh, scaly wings. The larvae are often more terrestrial, but some are aquatic. And the adults feed on nectar or suck blood of vertebrates or other insects and arthropods. Now there's one subgenus that uh, will feed on vertebrate blood, but most of them, if they do feed on blood, it's going to be the blood of insects and other arthropods, including spiders and as you saw that daddy long legs. They will visit the flowers of several plant species, so it's not just chocolate that they'll visit, um, but they will visit several types of plants um, and both the males and females will feed on nectar um, to get energy, and then the females may feed on other things to get more nutrients for their young. So uh, this is actually one of my favorite photos recently. I just took this a couple weeks ago. Uh, this was a light I set up outside. This uh, little male punky came to the light, this Forsipamaya, and it's such a beautiful little fly. Again, this thing was less than two millimeters long, so about a uh, 16th of an inch long, and but when you magnify it and blow up that photo, it's just this beautiful golden hairs and these really cool patterns on the wings. And you can see those fluffy hairs that the males have. Now the males don't bite uh, humans, uh, don't feed on blood as the same as mosquitoes, uh, but they will feed on nectar. So Matt, only, only the males have this kind of antenna that actually, can we say that it looks like a bunny? Yeah, so they're, they're called plumose antennae. So they're feather-like or uh, fluffy. Um, it's, so actually in this group of uh, flies that includes things like non-biting midges and mosquitoes and a couple other groups, uh, most of them, the males have these really fluffy bottle brush type uh, antennae and the females have much less hairy antennae. And part of it is that they, uh, these hairy antennae are used to hear the females. So they can hear the wing beat of the females and tune into that. Um, and so it's to help them find a mate. But, um, but not all flies have this kind of way where they have fuzzy versus not. Um, but again, mosquitoes is the same thing. Mm -hmm. 
Now, these are what the adults look like, but the larvae are really interesting. So here's a pupa in the background. That's the in-between stage in between a larva and an adult. Um, but the larvae are much less worm-like than that one I showed you previously. They actually kind of look like a caterpillar. Um, they're kind of hairy. And this one was actually found in my yard under some bark of a dead log. Uh, so they will uh, squirm around. They have little tiny false legs because uh, no tr flies have true legs as larvae. And they'll squirm around and they'll find fungi and molds and uh, bacteria and stuff like that to graze. And they're really cool looking. I really need to get out and see more of them. But what's really fantastic is some of the crazy forms they come in as well. So there's this really great photographer, uh, Andy Murray, who takes these really great photographs of really tiny critters, especially in the soil and in logs and things like that. And he has a whole series of these crazy looking larvae of uh, Forsipomyia. So this is not, um, this is not, debris on it that's actually produced from the larva. It's got these crazy uh, puffs on its head and tail. Um, and you can see there's so many crazy ones. So this one has these huge golden puffs. This one has these balloon-like structures. This one has covered itself in debris. And this one's blue. Uh, so, and I also think they have this, the head looks like a horse. So the mouth parts are facing the ground. It's got this little tiny eye and they're kind of adorable little critters. Uh, and again, very common, and they will grow up to be those those little tiny flies later on in life. Am I um, the function of those puffy things? Yeah, so it's it's not exactly known. It's not a well-studied thing, but they think it partly the little globules on them sometimes may have antimicrobial product uh, um, um, uses, and also they may deter predators. Uh, these, who knows? And this, who knows? It may be make them untasty, not tasty to predators, things like that. They are eaten by mites and some other groups of small predators that live in the same habitat, but we really don't know. It's, it's probably for defense, though. And how, how big are they? They're tiny. They're only a millimeter long or so. So they're, they're tiny, tiny. So again, he takes really great photos. Uh, he has a uh, really great, great setup for taking these amazing high magnification photos. And uh, like I said, I'd, we have some, apparently we have some just like this. I saw in Bug Guide, there was one from South Carolina taken that looks like this. So I'm really confident I'd like to go out and and really find some more of these because they're just amazing little critters. And again, the, this this genus is very common everywhere across the world, basically. And what is their lifespan? So that I don't know. I think it only, uh, from what I read on one paper, it takes about uh, a month total to go from a very from an egg to an adult. So it's it's not long, but it's not short, I guess either for such small flies, especially. And then the adults live for probably a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. And so. if you, if we want to find them, where do we have to look? So the larvae, you're going to look probably under bark or under, under rocks, um, in leaf litter, you know, kind of places where there's a lot of decaying matter. Uh, but for the adults, uh, they will be on maybe on flowers, but also, uh, if they're attracted to lights. So if, if you leave your porch lights on or put out insect lights, you'll get them attracted. Now, of course, they're going to look like a little tiny speck on your siding or on a sheet. They are very, very tiny. Uh, in fact, the one I took a photo of, uh, this one, uh, I could barely tell what it was in the dark. And I took the photo and was able to say, ooh, this is this beautiful little midge. Um, again, those are the threads from a very fine bed sheet. So very tiny critters. So yeah, so the larvae are really crazy, and I, I love them. But um, the adults, I, I told you about how they suck the blood of, of the hemolymph of arthropods. Um, but this, uh, this uh, series by Gil Wisen, who's really another great uh, biologist, uh, entomologist, and photographer, shows uh, this uh, one is feeding on a stick insect. And you can see it looks fine. But after a while, they actually expand with fluid. And they get so big that they can't even fly away anymore. And they actually call these tick flies in some areas um, because they will fill up and engorge on this hemolymph. It's really protein rich. It'll help the female lay eggs. And then she basically has to walk away because she can't fly anymore. So they're just an amazing group. I'd love to see this phenomenon. I think if I had waited long enough, maybe for that one on the, 
the dad long legs, I could have seen it more. But in the tropics, it's fairly common on all different types of insects. Um, and they can be common here too. Okay, so uh, that's, uh, you know, I talked about the flies and the tree. So now you know the two players. So let's now get them together. Let's see what happens. So uh, like I said, they're all over the world. Um, and so in plantations or in areas where there's a lot of cocoa being grown, the, the theobroma plants, the trees, uh, areas like this leaf litter with this rotting husks and, um, you know, uh, trees that have some stumps or rotting logs of them are really great habitats for the young, for the larvae. Uh, as we saw what the larvae look like and the situations they live in, all of these rotting pods and these husks are good farms for bacteria and fungi on which the larvae feed on. So, so that's one good area. They've also found in the tropics, there was a, there was a really interesting paper about uh, aquatic breeding sites for uh, pollinators of it and bromeliads were, were sampled. And what they did was they looked at two different types of bromeliads, one with a larger amount of water and one with a little less and then at different heights, some up in the trees and near the ground. And while the ground had a lot of diversity of all different critters in them, the ones up in the trees are the ones that house the uh, pollinating uh, punkies, the midges. Uh, so the larvae will live in these aquatic, semi-aquatic, even if they're not filled with water, they're filled with maybe decaying uh, organic matter that's a great resource again for these larvae. Mm -hmm. So what is the season that is the best season to find them. Yeah, so um, to find the uh, the midges. Yes. Yeah, so I think what they did uh, for that is they I think they dumped out all the water into the contents from the bromeliads and then uh, sorted it out. You can usually you can often put them all in alcohol um, and then sort them out later. The the dead preserved insects uh, for a study like that. Um, one of the the reasons they did the study is because that. They saw that um, growers, uh, cacao growers, were um, were getting rid of these bromeliads because they seem like they're parasites, uh, parasitic plants. But really, they're kind of just epiphytic. They're just growing up there, and because they're a home for the pollinators, they're actually destroying habitat if they do that. Um, but yeah, as far as collecting, again, it's uh, lights for the, the adults and some other situations and then just decaying matter, just surging through decaying matter for the, uh, for the larvae. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as the actual attraction and pollination, it's a very interesting story. So again, I, I'm alluding to the fact that cocoa is really mainly pollinated by forsythomyia. Um, but there are other ceratobagonid midges that they've, uh, they've associated with cocoa and have visited, and also even some other flies, but apparently forsythomyia is the most successful and the most important. Um, and both sexes visit the flowers, so the males and females will both do it. They actually can get a lot of big pollen loads on them, uh, and because again, like I said, they have very tiny flowers and these are very tiny flies, they are attracted to the flowers and get covered in the pollen. So for pollination to occur, actually, the flies have to fly up here and visit the nectaries and get the pollen on them. And then when they're flying around, they often land on this style or these staminoids, uh, actually often the staminoids, which are these, the other part of the male plant, uh, part of the flower. And when they land on that, their back actually touches, or the thorax touches this female part and transfers the pollen. So actually, the flies actually need to be over two millimeters to be effective at pollinating because if not, they're too small to touch when they land on this part. So it's not just all species, but specifically certain species that are certain size, two or three millimeters long. Um, and so they'll go from one flower, they'll get collect pollen, they'll fly to another tree, land on here, the pollen will rub up against here, and apparently it takes about 40 pollen grains to have a successful pollination, um, and some of these can carry way more than 40 grains on each individual. Now, what's attracting them to there? So it's really interesting. This is actually the most interesting part of my research that I found. Um, was they looked at the odors from these flowers and it's not a typical flower odor. The actual chemicals that are coming off it smell more like insect cuticle or insects than it does flowers. So one of the hypotheses is that because they feed on it with other insects, this may be attracting them to the flowers. They get a little reward with the nectar 
but that doesn't have a lot of nectar, it doesn't have a lot of scent, so it's not attracting other types of insects. But these flies are especially uh, uh, adapted to go visit them. This also may be why in when they plant uh, cocoa in other areas of the world, they still get these midges coming to them. It's not that the midges evolved to only find those flowers in the native range. It could be because they're a general type of insect smell. And so it's a really cool system. I thought that was really interesting. Um, and, uh, and it just is a really cool evolutionary uh, thing. So that's how they're attracted to the flowers. Now, as far as pollinating, they found that the, the cocoa trees actually have a couple different forms of their flowers. There are some where these little staminoids uh, converge, they come together at the tip. Uh, there are the ones where the staminoids are parallel and then there's ones where they're splayed out. And so they found that, of course, the splayed out ones, because the fly was then further away from the female part, were not as good for being pollinated. The other two were, but luckily, this uh, form of flower was not as common on the cocoa plants. So basically, they, uh, they're lucky that they have these types and that they're able to be pollinated that way. They did another, there was another really interesting study. Uh, this was a thesis done where um, basically they uh, found, they used, this person used uh, trees that could self-pollinate. Remember, most of them can't self-pollinate, but they have a variety that could self-pollinate. And what they would do is they first observed what types of insects were commonly at cocoa flowers. And they took some of these insects in different densities. And this is the most percentage of pollination that they were, uh, 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 that they were, um, that they found when they caged these insects next to the flowers. They had no choice but to go around the flowers and pollinate. And so thrips, which are a really common group of insects at flowers, had only 1% pollination. Bees, which most people think of as like the great pollinators. These bees actually in nature apparently love coming to cocoa flowers, but really what they do is they steal the pollen and they don't actually transfer the pollen. So they only had about 3%, even with many individuals in a small cage with the flowers. Ants, 10% uh, and aphids, 28%. But when they put one single fly in the same type of cage with those flowers, they had 52% pollin pollination of those, of those flowers. Um, of course, these are artificial studies uh, in nature. They're going to be a little less, you know, they're not going to be restricted to that one cluster of flowers or, or kind of held captive. But you can just see that one individual can have such an impact on the pollination of chocolate. So these, these uh, studies are really there to show that the importance of these flies in the system and that um, other, other insects, even though they will visit the flowers, are just not as good at, at a pollinating. So we really rely on these flies and anybody who says, you know, they hate all flies and things like that. I like to tell them that you have chocolate to thank, you know, chocolate, if you like it, you have flies to thank and uh, these little flies and some of these flies that bite humans uh, in this group. So it's really interesting where these are really annoying flies, but some of them can actually help us out by uh, helping trees out. Pat, I have a question on the chat. Sure. Uh, from from again. So if I plant a cocoa plant in my backyard, will these flies find my tree? That would be really interesting. Now I haven't. I I imagine they would, just because again we have forsythia here very commonly. Um, and in fact, that night that I was trapping this, so that I took this photo, um, I found at least a couple other individuals, females and males. And like I said, those larvae were in my backyard, and that's in Cary. North Carolina. So we, uh, they're everywhere. So I'd be curious. It'd be really interesting to see. Uh, but, you know, I just don't know if anybody has planted them other places in the U.S. Um, and in fact, this one, this study was done in Costa Rica where the plants were not native. And that was part of it is that once they started planting them in Central America so much more, they were still getting a lot of visits by these flies. So I would say I would imagine that they would come to it. And I have another question from Sarah that said, do the cocoa plants provide a food reward for the visiting midges or are they only tricked by the smell? Yeah, so um, I think from what I've read, they do have some nectar. It's just very, very small amounts. 
Um, and in fact, again, bees will visit these flowers too. So, and bees don't usually visit flowers unless they're getting some nectar or a lot of good pollen. And because these are so small, I imagine that they're like, that they're attracted to that. Now, an interesting thing that I thought of is that the bee that they use is called a trigona. It's a, uh, a stingless bee. Um, and these bees are actually kind of odd in that they have some different dietary uh, um, phenomena sometimes. For instance, they'll be sometimes attracted to rotting meat and other things. So they're kind of a strange group of bees, but uh, in, in, I don't know a lot about bees, but in, in general, they're probably very similar. So they probably wouldn't be attracted to the plants if they didn't have some kind of uh, smell or nectar to provide but it's probably in such small amounts that if for the flies it's great, but for other insects, it may not be worthwhile. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't have much else to say other than just a couple of conclusions. So um, the Theoboma cacao is a finicky plant when it comes to commercial production, actually, as you probably gathered from this, it, it takes very small flies and, and actually, um, uh, hand pollination is used in addition to natural pollinators out in these plantations oftentimes. Uh, it's easier sometimes to just take a paintbrush, I guess, and get some pollen and, and swap it between plants. Uh, again, you have to be also very, um, uh, very prepared because they're only open for a short period of time. But um, Pollination by, uh, of cacao by forsythmia is important and has its limitations, but it has, there are many factors that contribute to the fruit development. Uh, and because that you want also these natural pollinators, maintaining suitable habitat for the larvae uh, is important. So uh, um, uh, Julia gave a talk on uh, pollinators uh, just before me, and uh, she mentioned pesticides and things like that and, and natural habitats. That's also the case for these flies as well. So using too many pesticides or completely, for instance, when they, they did an experiment where they, um, they cleared out all the debris and all that stuff around the plants, it makes it look nice. Maybe it's easier to walk around. Uh, but they did the experiment where they left it or even augmented the area with rotting uh, material and they had a huge percentage increase in the, pollen the natural pollination by these flies. So you really have to have the environment for those flies to be around uh, and they're surely going to come to the flowers, at least some of the flowers, and help pollinate it. Um, so that's all I have, uh, and I will say that when I saw this fly, I said it should be the poster child for Godiva, or because of these golden hairs on it, and I think it's really, uh, they need a better image, and I think the flies at least, um, and uh, I think it's, it'll be a great uh, mascot for chocolate, just to give awareness out there, uh, because people just don't understand, they think that bees are the only things that pollinate, uh, and that you know flies are kind of useless so again if you like your chocolate uh definitely thank a fly uh you may not want to thank the ones that are biting you at the beach necessarily because they're also a little bit different group but they uh, are part of their cousins are helpful at least okay so if you have any questions please write it down on the chat and we will ask matt so we have a question from jen are these flies or the trees endangered so um, I don't know about all the species of Theobroma. I don't know uh, much about them in general. I assume some of the species are probably a little bit more threatened than others. Of course, Theobroma cacao, the main chocolate plant, is has so many varieties and has planted all over the world. Uh, so it's not really endangered. It's it's basically a, an agricultural crop. So, um, but there are pressures on them. There's a lot of diseases of these plants uh, and uh, climate change and weather issues are really gonna um, stress and make it difficult for production of, of chocolate. So things like coffee and chocolate that are really only grown in the tropics um, need a lot of attention. They're gonna become probably more expensive in the future as things get worse for them. Um, so they, but I, I'd love to know more about the other Theobroma species and especially also why they're not, you know, suitable for the chocolate that we eat. Who knows if there's some weird rare one that has the best tasting chocolate ever, but uh, I have no idea. That's for the chocolate people. <laughs> <laughs> so a question um, from Katie was like, when you show this uh, cocoa bean, if the white part has a name? Um, yeah, it's called, I have to look it up again. Again, it's, um, it's called, I don't know if it's just called the flesh or whatever, but um, 
Let me, let me look it up. Uh, that's the great thing about, you know, these things is the virtual talks. So I can look it up real quick. <laughs> um, again, I'm not an expert on chocolate, um, but um, yeah. So, so it's called, they, they just call it a white pulp. So the pulp, um, mm -hmm. and I, I think I've had it when I was on vacation once and it, and it did taste sweet. It was, it was kind of like, um, it's very fruity. Um, um, but yeah, they, they apparently eat it some places, but I think it's just something that can't be transported or, or, or processed to, to meet demands. So. Okay. And I have a couple of questions that I'm going to join them. So one is, what is the best species of cocoa to plant in North Carolina? And if the normal insects that we have on your yard can take the duty of pollinate those trees? Yeah, again, I, I'm not sure. It's uh, it would be interesting to see. I, I would imagine that this one would be because there's probably a lot of varieties, and they probably grow. They've grown them in different areas and have you know different varieties have different tolerances. I would imagine that this species, Theobroma cacao, would be the one to grow, and it would be um, uh, something to look for different varieties that might be hardy, say in a little more northern area. But um, I'd be curious. I have no idea what the regulations are or the, uh, the agriculture, the, the consumer um, uh, horticulture growth of these, of these types of trees in North Carolina is. Again, I've never Hello. actually heard of anybody that uh, grew one here. Hello? Yes. Um, yeah, so Jesse, we can hear you. So, okay. So uh, <laughs> no we have another ghost. So um, how many midges can live in one log? So do they live in colonies or? Yeah, some, I think when you find them, you can find groups of them sometimes. I mean, I don't think that they are, one of the papers said that they're fairly communal. So if the females find a good spot, a lot of them will lay eggs there. Um, you know, it's very patchy. So, you know, you may look out across the ground and see, that it, it looks you know, all the same, but they can smell the parts of the areas that really are most, you know, it's like finding the most safe place for your young uh, and the, most, the place that they're gonna have the most food. And so you will sometimes get lots of them laying their eggs in the certain areas. And they've in fact, for some of the studies, they've actually, you can rear them in the lab on certain uh, things. So, so certain um, um, artificial diets will, you can raise them on, so. Mm -hmm. So something that I've been seeing on the chat, and I said I'm going to ask that at the end, <laughs> is that is how can you take those amazing pictures? Can you give us any <laughs> advice, any tricks? Uh, I just have you know I um I have a camera, an SLR camera that has a good lens, and I have a, a good magnification lens on it. So when I see a really tiny critter. I snap that onto the front and that gives me more magnification. But the the actual photo, um, let me see if I can show you here. I'll show you, try and show you the photo because it's, it's pretty funny to see when it's not cropped and everything like that. But, um, but let's see. Because I have to say those pictures are great. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I, well, I really enjoy taking these photos of little critters because, again, you uh, with uh, without being able to see them, you really, uh, if you've never seen one, it's really surprising, especially because they're so tiny. Um, so here is, uh, let me see if I could share this. Yeah, actually, yeah, I'm. I have a very bad luck when I try to take pictures of of animals okay. because I all I always see the animals when I don't have my camera with me. Yeah, well, I, I try and get my camera out when I, especially when I have sessions like this with the light trap or if I'm going out in nature. Um, I'm not sure if you can see this now, but yep. that was cropped from that, and this is also like a two x magnification uh, from my regular macro lens. So it's, it's really, they're, they're very tiny. And again, when, when you see one in real life, it's the, you know, it can rest on a freckle, basically. They're very small insects. Um, and I'm also very interested in the very small insects because I think they're 
more interesting sometimes. Uh, and again, people can't see them with their eyes, but if you take really good photos, uh, you can just present them to the world and, and everything, so. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty sure that a lot of people on, on, on this program is thinking, oh my God, I would love to do what Matt does. So what is your advice for them if they are studying or they don't know what, to, what, what path to follow, but they want to do what you do? Mm -hmm. What do you have to do? Yeah, so um, uh, to be an entomologist in general, I think you just have to have an open mind and a passion for nature. Now, of course, some entomologists are uh, more into protecting plants or uh, health, you know, protecting health by eradicating insects or, or at least controlling and managing insects. That's obviously a very important job. So uh, people study, you know, you have to get a basic uh, um, learning and, and, and schooling in biology and chemistry and things like that. Um, and, you know, we have, the thing is with entomology, there's, with entomology, you can just do, just about do anything because insects and also arthropods like uh, mites and, and spiders are all over the place and they basically do just about everything. So you can use them for all different genetic models. You can use them as uh, indicators for the health of ecosystems. So really it's kind of just uh, figuring out what you really like the most. And if you like butterflies and dragonflies, that's great. And you study those. I'm, I'm not actually that kind of person. I like the gross and weird things. And so, <laughs> and venomous and creepy things. So I like fly, I love flies and all these things. And so, but once you get in, then you really find you know, you may find, you may change directions. You may find something you like. I know uh, uh, a colleague of mine would always go, you know, whenever he'd find something new, he said, if I had to start it all over again, I'd do this and, you know, say I'd, I'd study these. And it's like, you, you know, he'd be working on one group and then he'd see something else and, and he'd be like, okay, I want to study these now. <laughs> and so it just takes, you know, curiosity and passion and, uh, and just, you know, and it all depends. Every every different uh, facet of entomology takes different personalities, I think. That is great. So I think that, I mean, I can only see good comments on, on the chat. So I have to say thank you very much, Matt, for being with us today. For the rest, you have to know that Matt is going to be with us in other programs during Backfest. So check out backfest.org to check, to see in what programs is is he going to be because mm -hmm. who doesn't want to talk more with me <laughs> well and for? yeah and saturday i'll be giving uh my main talk on mm -hmm. the crazy flies that you can find in north carolina so that's uh stay tuned for that that's saturday i think at 11 and uh i'm going to be showing photos of all the coolest craziest insects including some of these midges probably but all these other things that people don't know live around them I and then, yeah, and then tomorrow night, of course, uh, movie night. So, <laughs> yeah, we're going to watch The Fly, yeah. of course. Another so, favorite. <laughs> yeah. So, before uh, ending, so what is Backfest without a Backfest shirt? So, if you want one, so go to backfest.org, or if you renew or join the membership, uh, you will get one for free. If you like this program, please think on, on donating at the museum more now than ever. We need it to keep this program on. And remember that we are going to reopen the museum. Finally, we are going to have the chance to see you again. So the 22nd of this month. So again, for more information, check naturalsciences.org and for more programs, backfest.org. So check it out because we have tons and tons of programs during the whole week. So again, thank you, Matt, for being with us. I will see you tomorrow. And for the rest, have a wonderful Backfest week and see you on the next program. Bye-bye. Thanks, Hugo. Thank you, everyone.